Tonight, the state of Israel will do all that is needed to defend itself. With the Middle East on the brink, world leaders gather in Italy to call for de-escalation following Iran's attack on Israel. And new details emerge about the situation that led to the deadly Lahaina wildfires in Hawaii. Plus, it's not just like one bad street, right, or like one bad area. It's everywhere. How some progressive policies are driving people out of America's biggest cities. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. The United States and Britain hit Iran hard with more sanctions while Western leaders try to prevent a full-scale war. Thanks for joining us for Faith Nation. I'm John Jessup. And I'm Tara Mergener from the CBN studio in Washington. Iran is warning Israel against any direct retaliation following its unprecedented airstrike over the weekend. Yet another consideration for Israeli leaders as they weigh a potential invasion of Rafah. CBN White House correspondent Abigail Robertson brings us the latest on the escalation. Abigail. That's right, John. As part of the back and forth, an Iranian commander suggests the country might review its nuclear doctrine following threats of a response. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says world leaders are urging his government to go easy on any retaliation plans. I want to make clear that we will make our own decisions and the state of Israel will do all that is needed to defend itself. Iran's president, Ibrahim Raisi, threatened Israel Wednesday warning if they do a tiniest invasion against our territory, they should be assured that they will face a massive and harsh response. We are preparing ourselves for the next time, debriefing the mission and seeing how could we prepare ourselves for the, for the next attack uh, if it would uh, come. Israel is also communicating with the U.S. about an invasion of Rafah, a move the Biden administration warns could lead to massive civilian casualties. My faith gives me tremendous hope. All this as family members of hostages prepare for the Passover holiday without their loved ones. For Rachel Goldberg Poland, whose 23-year-old son was taken on October 7th, the question as to how many hostages might still be alive is agonizing. I don't know how I could do this without knowing that someone is in charge mm -hmm. of this whole complicated, painful, difficult situation. While more than 130 remain in Gaza, Israel estimates about a quarter might be dead and acknowledges that number could be much higher. The uncertainty is creating challenges in ongoing ceasefire negotiations as the release of remaining Israeli hostages is a major element. With peace talks in a delicate phase, the country of Qatar is reassessing its role as a key mediator between Israel and Hamas. Tara, John. All right, CBN White House correspondent Abigail Robertson. Thank you so much, Abigail. Well, Simone Ledeen is the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Mideast Policy, and she joins us now for more. Welcome to you, Simone. So at the heart of this, as Abigail just reported, there are still people being held hostage who have yet to come home. Are conditions, Simone, for their return more dire now with reports of counterstrikes and with Qatar considering whether to continue its role as leading in these negotiations? I think the important thing, I think, yes, their, their situation is uh, extremely dire. I think it's important also for us to remember that they are not being treated well. They are not being fed properly. They're not being given medication. Mm. So, yes, as the more time passes, the more dire their situation is. Do you believe the cooperation we saw between Israel and Arab nations leading up to and during Iran's attack signifies perhaps a new phase in Middle East geopolitics? I think that a lot of the conversations that have been held in private are now coming out into the public sphere, uh, as we saw the other night. But I think it's clear, and, and rightfully so, Gulf partners uh, now have publicly asked the United States for a security partnership such as the United States has with Israel because they have put themselves at risk um, by publicly coming out sort of on the side of the U.S. and, and Israel. So, Simone, the Biden administration is targeting Iran's drone program as well as auto and steel with new sanctions. Meanwhile, Tehran is threatening to review its nuclear doctrine, as Abigail just reported, as Israel mulls a counterstrike. Where do you see all of this heading? 
Well, I think first and foremost, uh, the Biden administration could actually have maintained the sanctions uh, that were in place in January 2021. Um, they also allowed a United Nations sanction uh, against uh, the Iranian ballistic missile program to expire uh, during the Biden administration's term, which has been very harmful. So I think it's uh, very important to keep that in mind um, as we look to the future and the potential actions that the Biden administration could take. They have put themselves on their heels, uh, which was really was not necessary. Simone, Israel apparently had greenlit retaliatory strikes, but decided for whatever reason not to move forward. And now it's reporting. Reporting suggests it may not hit back until after Passover. So why telegraph a timeline for a counterstrike? I think that's an excellent question. And it's important to remember that a lot of different messaging is telegraphed during times of conflict that may or may not actually be true. Um, Yes, they have said that they're going to wait until after Passover, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the case. I think it's also important to keep in mind that there are many types of actions that Israel can take. Some of them are very public uh, in terms of missiles and rockets and drones and things that explode. Um, but Israel has a lot of different capabilities um, that certainly the War Cabinet is discussing and that Israel will bring to bear um, as they decide how to retaliate against the Iranian attack. In just a few seconds, if you can, the Saudis' um, reporting suggests they believe that Iran struck to sabotage the normalizing of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Your thoughts on that? I'm extremely confident that that's the case, and I think we can actually trace that back to the October, the beginning of this whole conflict, which was the October 7th attack uh, against Israel by Iran's proxy Hamas. That kicked off this entire cycle, and uh, that certainly was timed because, uh, as we know, there was, uh, there was an announcement that was fairly imminent uh, about Saudi normalization with Israel. And by the way, I'm still quite hopeful that that will take place. Mm. Uh, I don't think that it's killed that. Uh, it's just delayed it. All right, Simone Ledeen, thank you for your great insights. We, really, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Simone. Well, we're learning more about Speaker Mike Johnson's decision to move forward on aid to Ukraine despite threats of his ouster. The call for a floor vote came after a lobbying effort by evangelicals who say America's military and financial support is tied directly to religious freedom across Eastern Europe, including Ukraine's Christian community. The Baptist Standard reporting Johnson's strong stance came after he personally met with two leading Ukrainian evangelicals and other Christian leaders at the Capitol on Wednesday. Still, a vocal minority in the GOP conference opposes the $95 billion aid package that also supports Israel and Taiwan individually. Under the threat of removal, Speaker Johnson says he's not worried about keeping his job. I would rather send bullets uh, to Ukraine than American boys. My son is going to begin in the Naval Academy this fall. This is a live fire exercise for me, as it is so many American families. This is not a game. It's not a joke. And those bills are due for a vote this Saturday. Pro-life advocates are applauding Arizona's lawmakers for upholding the state's abortion ban. Republicans in Arizona's House late Wednesday blocked the repeal of a 19th century law that bans nearly all abortions. The state Supreme Court reinstated the controversial measure last week. Meanwhile, the Arizona State Senate advanced its own legislation to repeal the law, but further required votes could be weeks away. A new report from Hawaii's attorney general highlights communication breakdowns contributing to the deadly chaos during wildfires in Maui over the summer. The, the report finds police, fire and other emergency responders had trouble coordinating with each other in August as flames consumed homes and businesses in Lahaina. With cell networks down, each agency used separate channels. In addition, with no cell service, many residents and tourists couldn't get emergency alerts or call for help. The result, one of the deadliest fires in U.S. history. More than six months later, the church on the island is still working to bring hope to the hurting. And I think when we're rooted in Christ, we can survive anything. And that's really a picture of, of the people, especially the Christians on Maui. You know, their faith is strong, but many of them have lost literally everything. They've lost their homes they have lost their livelihood. And even more tragically, so many have lost their lives. 
This is what the church does best. You know, we can shine in times of difficulty. And some experts say rebuilding the fire ravaged town of Lahaina could take two decades. Well, the rise of AI porn is schools scrambling for solutions. How you could protect your kids after this. Welcome back. A disturbing new trend is hurting families across the United States. An online surge of AI-generated child porn. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children received nearly 5,000 reports of AI depicting minors last year. It also discovered predators are using pornography generated by artificial intelligence to extort money from children or their parents. The FBI says it doesn't take a computer-savvy person to create this kind of content. Even the most basic users can generate realistic videos and pictures from artificial intelligence. Some teens are using the technology to alter pictures of their clothed classmates to make them appear nude. Schools are scrambling to crack down on this kind of behavior, and lawmakers are working to close legal loopholes that could allow these crimes to go unpunished. Wow. Well, Don Hawkins, uh, CEO of the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, joins us now for more. Don, gosh, this is terrifying. Children and their families are being extorted now for financial gain. What allowed this disturbing trend to proliferate so quickly? Well, you know, the AI and, and emerging technology brings so many amazing things, but one of the horrific things it brings is the ability to create mass scale child sexual abuse and image-based sexual abuse. It's just, we can't even fathom 5,000 reports at NCMEC last year. It's going to be like hundreds of thousands of reports in the next 20, mm. 12 months. It's, it's, this is a massive crisis that we're facing. You talk about the crisis, and in the midst of the crisis, schools have proven ill-prepared and ill-equipped to deal with this, while the legal system scrambles for solutions. Um, what do you think would make people think twice before victimizing children in this way? Everything is backwards. I, I, you know, right now we need we need legislation to catch up so so quickly. There is some child protection legislation before Congress the Kids Online Safety Act that could help really drastically get a handle on this. But the reality is too that we need people to call out companies like Apple and Google and Microsoft who are facilitating this. Apple and Google Play are hosting tons of nudifying apps that are rated for ages even four and nine years old. So our kids are using this mm. against each other. Microsoft, the majority of the the, t the tech that's being used to create this comes from Microsoft's GitHub. It's being hosted there. So really going after these three big companies will make like the biggest impact right now. Don, there's another troubling side effect to all this AI too. The child abuse being generated also impedes the identification of kids who are actually being abused by predators. How prevalent is this? Unfortunately, we don't. We can't give you numbers, but we see it skyrocketing. I mean, we're talking about thousands and thousands of images in these cases, uh, and it, it can happen so quickly. You can just mass generate these images, and then they generate hundreds of thousands or millions of views in some cases. I'm sorry, I'm coming so to you with like crazy numbers, but it's just happening right now. No, it's sobering, and I think we need to know. So I think for most people who are watching who have kids, uh, they're, they're asking about advice for adults and, for that matter, their children on becoming victims. What advice do you have for them? You know, in order to create this AI-generated CSAM, all they need is a picture, a very innocent picture of a child. So, you know, don't post things on social media, which is so hard for us to do as parents, and I really urge our kids to keep things locked down as private. But really, unless we hold these tech companies accountable, there's very little we can do to prevent this from happening. This is the new, like, sexual harassment. Our, this will happen, undoubtedly. There's very little as, as parents we can do to help prevent it. All right, Don Hawkins with the National Center on Exploitation. Thank you so much for being with us, and thank you for this quite revealing conversation that we needed to have. Thank you. All right, up next, homelessness, crime, and rampant drug use. The new push to clean up America's biggest cities.
The Supreme Court is set to hear the biggest case concerning homelessness in decades. At the center of Monday's arguments is an Oregon town attempting to ban residents from public camping. Anyone caught sleeping at Grants Pass City Parks or on sidewalks faces fines or jail time. The homeless community there sued, saying they had nowhere else to go due to lack of local homeless shelters. Two federal courts ruled against the city, saying it was cruel and unusual punishment to find people who have no other way to survive, especially if they aren't committing crimes. The Supreme Court will decide if it is unconstitutional for authorities to criminalize camping on public property. The case will have implications for cities across the nation as they wrestle with a problem, too. Now for some surprisingly good news. Homicides are declining at a stunning pace in some major American cities. Axios reports Boston has seen an 82% drop in homicides since last April. That number fell by 37% in Philadelphia and 33% in Miami. Right here in the nation's capital, homicides have fallen by 25%, but not all cities are seeing the same trend. The number of homicides in Los Angeles have risen by 9% and they've gone up 15% in Atlanta. Many Americans are fleeing cities where crime, drug abuse and homelessness are rampant. And cities that once embraced progressive policies are now adopting tougher laws. CBN Still Heard has a story. When former Portland State philosophy professor Peter Bogosian decided to leave the city he loved, Portland, Oregon, he didn't mince words. Portland is like an open sewer. It's a cesspool. Murder over here, porch pirate over here, car stolen here, dog mutilated over here. The murder rate is up 300 percent. The homelessness is terrible. Addiction. That description fits a number of American cities where residents have moved on due to crime, drugs, tent cities, and trash. Cities like Seattle. I have witnessed one individual pull out a knife and start threatening a group of others. I uh, saw the aftermath of one shooting. Los Angeles. And I kid you not, you guys, there were at least five to seven crimes happening every single day. And these crimes weren't like five miles away, ten miles away. They were all within a mile of where we were living. In San Francisco. We saw needles on the floor and urine everywhere. It smells horrible. Everywhere. It's not just like one bad street, right? Or like <laughs> one bad area. It's everywhere. It's even on the main street. Not one cop in sight. Like not at all. I, did you see any cops? Not, uh, we didn't see any cops. Mm -hmm. As more and more people and businesses flee the crime and chaos in some urban areas, city leaders have realized they have to do something. In New York City, the National Guard has been called in to help fight the rampant crime on the city's subways. D.C. just passed a sweeping crime bill that increases penalties for theft and gun crime. San Francisco voters have approved two ballot measures that expand police surveillance and require drug tests for welfare recipients. Former prosecutor uh, Cully on, Stimson asked uh, why it criminal. took them so long. What happened in the last three years? Where have those policies been? They could have done this from the beginning. Uh, and, you know, we're supposed to forget about the tens of thousands of people who have died at the hands of violent criminals, the tens of thousands of businesses that have been robbed, the stores that have closed. We're not going to forget because they happened because of these liberal policies. We asked the president of the American Main Street Initiative, Jeff Anderson, why any city leader would think less law enforcement would turn out well. <laughs> well, it's a good question. I don't think anybody, sens any sensible person ever would have thought that. It's not often you see these really atrocious far left ideas implemented and carried out and then experimented on so quickly. I think the tent city quality of our cities with people just living wherever, drug addicts roaming around, rampant crime in our large cities, it's, it's become kind of a nightmare. We seem to be relearning all the lessons we had to learn in the 1960s and 70s before we got wise on crime again. Even the state of Oregon is throwing in the towel on its disastrous drug legalization. When we visited Portland last year, drug counselor Kevin Dahlgren showed us how city and state policies were attracting the drug addicted homeless from across the country. The homeless have told me, you know, it's very easy to be homeless because we're completely taken care of. We are fed, we are clothed, medical services come right to our tent. 
people give us anything they want. Oregon has finally decided that becoming the first state to decriminalize hard drugs was not such a good idea and is recriminalizing possession of drugs like heroin, cocaine, and fentanyl. And while some leaders may have seen the light on how to save their cities, Stimson says all the policy changes in the world won't help if district attorneys don't get tough on crime. Because the gatekeeper to the criminal justice system are the 2,300 elected DAs around this country. It doesn't matter what the city council passes or the mayor wags his finger about or the governor bloviates about. If the DA isn't going to carry through with the effective enforcement of the law, Chaos ensues, and that's what's been happening in these cities. Most people don't require a lot from their cities, but they do need them to be clean and safe. And that's exactly what a number of large cities can't seem to get right. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Coming up, a circus animal making an unexpected appearance. Next on Faith Nation. Finally tonight, taking the circus to the streets, literally, Tara. <laughs> exactly. A performer with Jordan World Circus surprised drivers in Montana with a special show. The circus elephant named Viola was getting a pre-show bath Tuesday afternoon when she was spooked by a vehicle. The elephant took off down a four-way <laughs> street, why not? Briefly stopping traffic and pedestrians in their tracks. She wandered through a parking lot and residential lawn where she stopped to have a snack, of course. There she is, she's still going. A circus trailer with another elephant inside found Viola and loaded her back in the vehicle, saying the elephants were happy to be reunited. Of course they were. Oh my goodness. Can you yeah. imagine just being out for a drive and seeing an elephant just I kind of like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for watching Faith Nation. See you tomorrow. <laughs> really, you'd like it. Yeah, yeah.